The president announces his Supreme Court nominee, Merrick Garland, is thrown into a political firestorm. He was the last Catholic left in the presidential race. Marco Rubio describes God's will for his life as he drops out. John Kasich scores a big victory at home in Ohio. Why it may be too late to catch Donald Trump. And running a diocese like a business, a bishop is recognized for his leadership style. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Wednesday, March 16th, 2016. We're following two big political stories tonight. President Obama names his Supreme Court nominee today. And a shakeup in the GOP presidential race. Marco Rubio drops out as Donald Trump extends his lead. Good evening from Washington, I'm Brian Patrick. We begin tonight's team coverage with Lauren Ashburn at our political desk. Brian, in the Rose Garden this morning, President Obama announced his pick for Supreme Court to fill Justice Scalia's seat. Merrick Garland is the chief judge of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia. I watched as Garland stepped up to the podium, emotionally beginning his remarks. He said this is the greatest day of his life, except for the day he married his wife. Today I am nominating Chief Judge Merrick Brian Garland to join the Supreme Court. In the sunny Rose Garden, the president introduced his pick to fill Justice Scalia's seat. I have fulfilled my constitutional duty. Now it's time for the Senate to do theirs. Thank you, Mr. President. This is the greatest honor of my life, other than Lynn agreeing to marry me 28 years ago. It's also the greatest gift I've ever received, except, and there's another caveat, the birth of our daughters, Jesse and Becky. If confirmed, Garland would be expected to align with the more liberal members, but he is not viewed as a down-the-line liberal. The GOP has vowed not to hold hearings on the president's nominees. Republicans say a confirmation fight in an election year would be too politicized. The Senate has never, never confirmed a nominee to the Supreme Court, to a Supreme Court vacancy, then opened up this late in a term-limited president's time in office. The next justice could fundamentally alter the direction of the Supreme Court and have a profound impact on our country. So, of course, of course, the American people should have a say in the court's direction. It is a president's constitutional right to nominate a Supreme Court justice, and it is the Senate's constitutional right to act as a check on a president and withhold its consent. Today's pick by the president, if confirmed, could play a major role in some important cases in the year ahead. Issues like state abortion rights and the Obamacare contraception mandate are on the table. Wyatt Goolsby reports on the impact a Garland Supreme Court justice could have. The Supreme Court is known as the highest court in the land. Its decisions affect more than just judges and lawyers. They impact society at large. The landmark case Roe v. Wade in 1973 legalized abortion, spurring pro-lifers all over the country to mobilize. Marilyn Musgrave at the Susan B. Anthony list says any nomination to the Supreme Court must be carefully considered. We have saw many pro-life laws passed around the nation, and those are at stake when we think of how a justice would rule in regard to things like clinic regulations, having the same standards uh, in these facilities that you would do for any other medical services. So this is incredibly important. Musgrave says Garland doesn't have a track record on the abortion issue, but she's skeptical any Obama nominee will be friendly to the pro-life cause. This is the most pro-abortion president we've ever had. So I don't think we have to wonder what kind of a person he would nominate and how he wants the balance to shift on the Supreme Court. Garland could potentially be a tiebreaker vote. Right now, four justices were appointed by Republicans and four by Democrats. If confirmed, he would be the fourth Jewish justice. The other five are Catholic. Wyatt Goolsby, EWTN News Nightly. We have more Supreme Court coverage coming up, including an interview with Carrie Severino from the Judicial, Judicial Crisis Network. Turning now to last night's primary elections, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton rode to victory, all but sweeping five states up for grabs. Clinton beat Bernie Sanders in Florida, North Carolina, Ohio, Illinois, and by 0.2% in Missouri. 
and Trump beat his competitors in every race except Ohio. His Florida victory forced Marco Rubio to drop out of the race. To win uh, the, the states that we won and to win by the margins, and especially, look, this is my second home, Florida. To win by that kind of a number is, is incredible. I've gotten more votes than anybody, including Donald Trump, and about 600,000 more. And uh, I think I'm ready to uh, take him on if he is uh, you know, in that position. The devastating loss for Marco Rubio gave the senator no choice but to drop out. In his emotional speech, he thanked God and said he was grateful for all of the help voters and staff gave him. While it is not God's plan that I be president in 2016, or, or maybe ever, and while today my campaign is suspended, the fact that I've even come this far is evidence of how special America truly is. Rubio told the Miami crowd he knows voters are angry and there's hunger for new voices in government. The Florida senator was considered an early favorite, but won just three presidential nomination contests. Rubio was the only remaining Catholic candidate. Ted Cruz is now reaching out to Rubio's supporters. After Governor Kasich's win in Ohio, he celebrated by playing hoops and then giving a speech filled with thanks, ending with a confetti drop. Jason Calvi was there in Berea, and he joins us now. You barely made it in here with all the traffic in Washington, D.C. It was a standstill out there. The subways closed down. It was a mess. Don't uh, go out there. Okay, I'm not going. We'll just stay here all night. <laughs> Tell us what it was like in Berea when he was giving that speech. It, it was exciting, and, you know, it can be summarized. I think his the theme of his speech was a song that played we heard before he took the stage, which is Journey's Don't Stop Believing. I'm not going to ask you to sing <laughs> it right now. Don't stop. <laughs> okay, okay, forget it. Keep but, going. But that's sort of the theme of, of his candidacy. He says... He's going all the way to the convention, which, by the way, will be in his home state of Ohio. But it's mathematically impossible, right? It is. It is. He needs to get to the magic number of 1237. That's the majority of delegates, and it's impossible for him to reach that by the time of the convention. So his only hope is what's called a contested convention, where the delegates on the floor pick the nominee because none of the, the candidates have enough uh, to get the majority. You talked beforehand. to a delegate uh, last night, right? Let's take a listen to and hear what he had to say. What we're going to do on, at our convention is, is we're going to come together. There's no backroom deals. There's no smoke-filled rooms. We will all be on the floor, all the delegates, and we will pick our nominee in Cleveland. So he says he's on board to do this. It seems like Kasich supporters are joining together to do this. And he is a Kasich delegate, so he will represent the governor on the floor as, as, as well as any other delegates that the governor picks up uh, uh, on the way to the convention. But uh, I asked him, you know, aren't, isn't the American people going to be upset? Let's say one of the other candidates, Donald Trump, for example, gets 1,000 delegates. That's not enough. That's not 1,237, therefore not a majority. And what happens then if the delegates at the convention pick somebody like Kasich? Aren't they going to be upset? He said, no, they're not. They're not. You also were able to ask him about a few things uh, related to life issues. That's right. Actually, the person we just heard from is uh, his day job is with the Ohio Right to Life. He's the president of that group. And I did ask him about Governor Kasich's pro-life uh, track record. And we have that. Let's listen to that. Our governor is the most pro-life governor in the history of Ohio. He signed 17 pro-life laws in the past five years. He's closed half the abortion clinics in Ohio. And we have historical low number of abortions in our state. I was struck yesterday by your report at Steubenville where you talked about all of the, the kids who were interested in, in supporting Kasich. Yeah, and Kasich, Rubio, uh, Trump, uh, you know, you, 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 everybody. But the one thing that was surprising, the first question, what was your issue? Life, immediately. They didn't even have to think about they it. They didn't even hesitate at Steubenville. Very interesting. Jason Calvi, thank you so much. Turning back to today's other big story, the president's Supreme Court nomination. Carrie Severino joined me earlier to talk about Chief Judge Garland's record. Tell me your thoughts on President Obama's nominee. Well, it's not surprising. We know the president wants a fifth liberal vote to really cement liberal dominance in the court and to have an opportunity to roll back some of the decisions he doesn't like, like the Second Amendment, to give people someone who's going to give deference to these administrative agencies. And he found that in Judge Garland. But Judge Garland, he, the president today in the Rose Garden, was painting him as a moderate, as someone who reaches across the aisle. Your thoughts on that? Sure. I mean, we know the president's going to want to present the person as a moderate. He always does this. But he did that with his last nominees as well. And we see what we got. Judge 
a Justice Sotomayor and Justice Kagan vote in lockstep with the liberal wing of the court. And actually, even groups that are you know, no conservatives like the New York Times have say he would vote right in the smack dab in the middle of the, the solid liberal bloc that's currently on the court. That means a laundry list of, of liberal agenda items, you know, removing all restrictions on abortion, uh, pushing back on the Second Amendment, uh, paving the way for Obama's executive actions. All of these things are likely things that we would see Judge Garland vote on. Do Republicans have the right to withhold consent, especially because the president voted to filibuster a Supreme Court nominee when he was a senator? Yeah, it's ironic to have someone who was the first president to ever have voted to try to filibuster a Supreme Court nominee now say, now let's all play nice. You know, it, and play it straight. And let's let's play it straight, right. right. You know, he, he, he was part of bringing the politics to this process, really. But I think at the end of the day, the Constitution absolutely gives the authority to the Senate to be a check on the president. That's their job. And they're doing that because the people elected a Republican Senate in 2014 to push back against a president who really was taking the extreme liberties with his position and really pushing the constitutional limits. So they're doing that. They're going to give a voice to the American people to let them decide who do you really want to choose the next Supreme Court justice. It's a unique opportunity to have this happen during an election year. If he were confirmed, which is highly doubtful based on all of the rhetoric from the Republicans. I don't even think he's going to get a hearing. What would that mean for the life issue and for religious liberty? You mentioned that he had clerked for Justice Brennan. Right. Right. And then he was, the, of course, the architect of Roe versus Wade. So if he follows in his ju justice's footsteps, I think we, we could be very clear that he's not someone who would be likely to overturn Roe versus Wade. I also think the president would never appoint someone he thought would, would not, in fact, be willing to expand abortion jurisprudence, possibly to change that 5-4 decision in favor of, of upholding restrictions on partial birth abortion. So uh, we, while he didn't rule on that case at the D.C. Circuit, I think, I think we know where he stands because the president knows where he stands. Thank you very much. Carrie Severino, Judicial Crisis Network. Brian, coming up. The challenge facing Christians in the Middle East, an Assyrian describes the importance of a genocide declaration. And the road to the White House, what it would mean to have a contested Republican convention. As we exit the confessional, we feel his strength, which gives new life and restores ardor to the faith. After confession, we are reborn. A year of mercy, Lenten tweet from Pope Francis. Thanks for joining us this Wednesday evening. I'm Brian Patrick. The State Department has until tomorrow to declare ISIS attacks on Christians and other religious minorities genocide. Ahead of that deadline, Catherine Zeltner sat down with Juliana Tamarazzi, an Assyrian Christian who fled Iran. She says the U.S. needs to declare genocide based on conscience. Juliana, you were in Iraq two weeks ago. Tell us what you saw. Complete destruction. Uh, people have been displaced. They've lost everything they've ever worked for. Uh, before, ISIS was the number one killer of the Christian community in Iraq. Today, it's cancer. Kids are dying of leukemia. Women are dying of breast cancer. Men are dying of colon cancer. Skin disease is running rampant. And these individuals are not able to work. They're literally living in a box. Six to seven to eight people are living in a box. As an Assyrian Christian, how is ISIS targeting your community? Well, um, they have killed us because of our faith. They have killed us because of our uh, nationality, our ethnicity. They have, as of last year in February, they've attempted to erase our monuments by destroying them in uh, Nineveh, in the city of Nimrod, for example. And it's just not the fact that they're killing us that we're being destroyed. They're destroying us every single day by us not being able to work. Through migration, we're being destroyed. For example, parents are being displaced in Canada. Uh, their kids, one son is in America, the other daughter is in Sweden. So the family is being completely destroyed. Our language is being destroyed. The deadline for the State Department to declare genocide is tomorrow. What do you want to say to the administration? Secretary Kerry, if we don't vote our conscience tomorrow, if we don't call this a Christian genocide as well as a Yazidi genocide, then we will see an ancient community being completely wiped out within the next hundred years because we as Americans chose not to call this what it is, a Christian and a Yazidi genocide. Juliana, thank you. Thank you. President Obama imposes new sanctions against North Korea today. The U.S. is cracking down on that communist country in response to its recent nuclear and missile tests. 
Meanwhile, North Korea sentences an American student to 15 years hard labor for crimes against the state. China's official news agency reports Otto Warmbier was arrested January 2nd as he was about to leave the country. At a news conference last month, which may have been coerced, Warmbier admits trying to steal a political banner from a Pyongyang hotel. The North Korean government claims the CIA may be connected with what it calls a hostile act. The Ohio Supreme Court rules the state can try again to execute a condemned killer who survived a 2009 botched execution. The court rejects arguments by death row inmate Romel Broom that a second attempt amounts to cruel and unusual punishment and double jeopardy. The state stopped Broom's initial execution after two hours. Executioners failed to find a usable vein following 18 attempts to insert needles for a lethal injection. Broom still has federal appeals pending. Well, today's commute is a nightmare here in Washington, with many government workers given the option to work from home. The D.C. area metro subway system is shut down all day following a series of electrical fires. The most recent was on Monday of this week. A similar fire last year resulted in the death of a passenger in a stranded train that filled with smoke in a tunnel. Unless inspectors find an immediate threat to passenger safety, metro will reopen tomorrow morning. We go back now to Lauren Ashburn our, at our political desk for more analysis of Tuesday's primaries. Mercedes Schlapp joins us. She's a Republican strategist and a former Bush spokesperson. Welcome. Hi, great to be here. Hi, good to have you. I know you're from Florida. You're Cuban-American. What do you make of Marco Rubio dropping out last night? Well, I think it was sort of bittersweet. Uh, part of it is obviously he was a rise in, in the Republican Party. At one point, he was almost called like the anointed savior. Of well, the Time Magazine Party had Time him Magazine. say that, right. And, right. Uh, and he really uh, had this optimistic message, which for 2016 is not the message that the GOP electorate was looking for. With that being said, also, his, he was deficient on a ground game, uh, besides the fact that his messaging wasn't quite where it needed to be. And he and, was lousy at the debate. And he had a debate that, uh, and he made several comments, which, the small hands comment, which I think it really didn't settle well with a lot of voters. He was a lot of people's second choice. Mm -hmm. He wasn't a lot of people's first choice. That's right. So now Donald Trump is storming ahead. John Kasich won Ohio. Sure. What does that mean for for moving forward to the convention? Well, what it means is a contested convention, most likely. And I'm going to say 90% of, of 90%. my chances okay. that we're going to end up in a contested convention. Why is because at this point, Donald Trump needs to win about 60% of the delegates going forward. That is a lot of delegates, especially when you still have Cruz right on his tail. Mm -hmm. uh, we know in Missouri, it was a they were separated by two tenths of, of a percentage in terms of, of the votes. And, and it's going to be it's not going to be necessarily super easy for Donald Trump to get there. It's going to be even harder for Ted Cruz to get there. So we might end up in July with the fact that none of these uh, candidates have the majority of the delegates. Speaker Boehner, former Speaker Boehner, came out today saying that uh, he thinks that Paul Ryan should uh, run in the or be, you know, throw himself into the ring and, in the contested and, convention. And that's why Speaker Boehner is former Speaker Boehner, because he is part of the old guard. We are seeing a GOP electorate where the working class, the middle class, they feel like they have a strong voice in this election. It is why you're seeing them over 80 percent in most of these states are going with an outsider. When I mean 80 percent, I'm talking Ted Cruz or Donald Trump. They are choosing the route that is we are not going the establishment route. And that is why you're seeing this change. And so for John Boehner, we love Paul Ryan. He's a great speaker. But the people are deciding. And at this point, it's a I would call it a two and a half man race. It's basically <laughs> Ted Cruz. And my 12 year old gave me that line. Oh, that's a good Cruz, one. Right. <laughs> Ted Cruz, Donald Trump and Kasich and play it. And point. finally, on Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders, she is swept up yesterday. Five states right through. Bernie didn't win anything. Right. It, should he stay in the race? I think for uh, Bernie, he's making that moral decision to stay in the race because he believes that his message of income inequality and the fact of Wall Street and uh, corporate America being corrupt is an important message to spread to uh, the different states. So for him, he has the money to stay in, Lauren. He has small donors who are constantly, I mean, they've been giving millions of dollars to this campaign, although he has no path. But I he think has for no him, path, about, but he has a lot of money. He has a lot of money, and he has the message that he wants to keep pushing forward because he doesn't want to let Hillary Clinton off the hook. And guess what? She is winning in the super delicate count, but her unlikability is high. Um, she is going to win the nomination, though. Right. So Mercedes, clearly she can thank you that. so much. Mercedes Schlapp, Republican strategist.
We appreciate your time. Thank you. Up next, the trial over leaked Vatican documents. See our report from Rome. And business leadership at a local diocese. A bishop taps into some of Wall Street's brightest minds. Thank you for joining us for EWTN News Nightly. I'm Brian Patrick, and the trial continues for five defendants in the Vatican. During this week's testimony, a Vatican Monsignor admits he passed confidential Holy See documents on to journalists. Ed Penton, Rome correspondent for EWTN's National Catholic Register, is following this trial. He is joining us from Rome. Ed, briefly frame this case for us, and where is this trial, where does it stand tonight? Okay, Brian, well, this is the case of uh, alleged leaking of Vatican, confidential Vatican documents to uh, two journalists who put them in a book, and the, the, it regarded uh, allegations of mismanagement and, and financial mismanagement in particular and, and waste. Um, and what's happening this week is the, the trial is underway. We've got um, hearings and uh, testimonies being given by those who are being accused of leaking these documents, and they include uh, a Vatican Monsignor, who was the Vatican official in charge of financial reform a couple of years ago, and uh, or at least helping with it, and also three lay people. Um, so they're giving their testimony this week. But I think the Vatican hopes that uh, some resolution will come at the end of next week. What do you think this trial tells us, if anything, about the state of things at the Vatican right now? Well, this is a very unique case, but what it does show is the, the Pope Francis' determination to root out this kind of thing. Um, some have said that uh, the Vatican has been a bit too hard on, these, on the accused, um, especially the two journalists who they claim were doing their own job. Um, but uh, the reason is because I think Pope Francis and the Vatican are very keen to root out and put an end to these things because, of course, Vati leaks. Um, a similar thing happened under Benedict XVI uh, three years ago, and uh, I think they're just determined to, to end this and make sure it doesn't happen again. All right, Ed Penton, the Rome correspondent for EWTN's National Catholic Register. Thanks for joining us from Rome, Ed. Thanks, Brian. Well, he's becoming known as the entrepreneurial bishop. A recent Forbes article profiles Bishop Frank Caggiano. He took over the Diocese of Bridgeport, Connecticut, with its $22 million in debt three years ago. Bishop Caggiano joining us by Skype from Bridgeport tonight. Your Excellency, your diocese was deep in debt, yet you have billionaires from New York's financial district there. What are you doing about that? Well, we've had a diocesan synod recently, and part of the initiatives of the synod is to really evangelize and engage all of our people. And part of what we're doing is using some well-accepted business practices to uh, engage people who are professional, to help them in leadership in the church. You talk about using the JetBlue model. What is that, and how is it working for the church there? It, uh, it refers specifically to our schools, because we have schools, as other perhaps dioceses, that have many empty seats. And so JetBlue began with the concept, fill every seat, and that's ultimately what our goal is. Is there anything wrong with thinking of the church in terms of business principles? No, not at all. It's, as I said in the article, it's a matter of adopting and adapting, because we're not a business. We're the mystical body of Christ. But we are also an institution, and we can learn from businesses, practices, financial accounting, and all the rest that needs to be done. And there are a lot of business practices that are necessary to keep a diocese running. Can you tell me how you tie this business approach with the church's ultimate mission of saving souls? Well, it's a matter of engaging, engaging leaders who have this professional expertise and allowing them to share that expertise with their parishes and with the diocese. The more we engage people and the more we allow them to use their gifts and talents, the more they will become active members of the church. So I see them related. Makes great sense. Bishop Frank Caggiano from the Bridgeport Diocese in Connecticut, thanks for joining us by Skype. Brian, thank you. You're welcome. Until tomorrow, for the EWTN News Nightly Team, I'm Brian Patrick. Thank you for watching tonight here on EWTN. Good night and God bless.